The um, Amherst Design Review Board is meeting today. I've got a phone call coming in. <laughs> um, virtually uh, on Monday, May 10th, 2021 at five o'clock. Oh, I got to, okay. My name is Catherine Porter, as chair of the Amherst Design Review Board. I call this meeting to order. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, GLC 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place, the public hearing of the Town of Amherst Design Review Board is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can attend tonight's virtual meeting by using the Zoom login information provided. I'd like to just take that off the phone. Provided on the meeting agenda, listed on the meeting calendar, which is provided on the Town of Amherst website. We will begin with a roll call of the members of the Design Review Board who have been impaneled for the consideration of the items on tonight's agenda. Board members, please say aye or yes to acknowledge your attendance for the record. Lindsay Schnarr. Yes. Janet Marquard. Present. Erica Zikos. Yes. And Tom Long. Present. And I would also ask if there are any disclosures at this time related to the hearings that we will be uh, uh, reviewing. Okay. Also in attendance is Maureen Pollock, planner and staff liaison to the Design Review Board and Christine Restrup, planning director. The Design Review Board and its accompanying zoning regulations were created by town meeting in October of 1983. The charge and purpose of the Design Review Board under section 3.2 of the zoning bylaw is to preserve and enhance the town's cultural, economic, and historical resources by providing for a detailed review of all changes in land use, the appearance of structures, and the appearance of sites which may affect these resources. The Design Review Board exercises this responsibility by providing design review and recommendations to private applicants and permit granting boards within specific overlay zoning districts in the town center, the design review overlay district and the town common design review overlay district. Design review is also provided for town departments and permit granting boards with respect to town projects anywhere in Amherst, which will result in substantial alteration to the form or appearance of a structure or site. All design review board meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. Each meeting recording will be uploaded to the Town of Amherst YouTube channel for public viewing. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the meeting, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will deliberate. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon recommendations for each respective application. Once the board has voted on its recommendations, the staff liaison will type up the recommendations for distribution to the applicant board, applicable land use board and building commissioner. Tonight's agenda for September 10th, 2021 is as follows. Uh, and we have the first is DRB FY 2021-12, Archipelago Investments, LIC. So, uh, Maureen, should we, uh, do we have our applicants here? Hello. 
Maureen, you're muted. That makes sense. Thank you, <laughs> Lindsay. Um, yes, yeah, so we have uh, Dave Williams and Kyle Wilson, uh, both of Archipelago uh, mm -hmm. present, uh, and, and they'll be uh, giving a presentation to the board. So if they can introduce themselves to the board. Hello, Kyle Wilson from Archipelago Investments. How are you? Dave Williams, it's been a long time since we've seen you and uh, looking forward to uh, that uh, that drink at the Lord Jeff <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> no, I'm comic relief. So yeah. Kyle's, Kyle's the, the man, uh, the man on the plan. So I'm going to mic myself off here. The dog will bark any minute, so. And Catherine, uh, perhaps uh, before the applicant gives their presentation, you could uh, briefly list out uh, the submissions okay. and uh, talk about uh, yes. the site visit. Sure. Okay. Uh, first, I wanted to uh, mention to anybody, any of the public who might be attending, that a design review board did do a site visit. Um, and Kyle Wilson, I want to thank you, Kyle. Uh, kindly took us uh, through the property from front to back, from side to side, discussed some of the landscaping, uh, potential tree removal in the uh, back where some old trees by the cemetery. Um, we discussed various aspects of the design. And uh, in addition, the uh, planning staff has submitted a project application report, zoning map, aerial map, property map, photographs for the project site from surrounding views to the north, south, east, and west. Uh, we see, received public comments submitted by Steve Schreiber, uh, dated May 3rd, 2021. Um, we've also reviewed the engineered site plan prepared by SVE Associates, the rendered site plan, landscape plan, and building plans prepared by Moda Studio Architecture Prototyping, among other documents. Uh, so I think that sort of gives everybody an idea of what we have been uh, reviewing up until this point when we're now going to hear from Archipelago. So would you like me, Maureen, to uh, take control of the screen or how, how best to manage this? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep, share your screen um, and uh, let me know if you need any assistance. I hope not. Let me see. <laughs> All right. So. These are the documents we submitted to the planning board. Um, I think I'll start with the design review board on with the architectural. I think that'll be able, I think that should allow us to go through um, and discuss the project. Uh, so this is the first sheet from the architectural, the drawings from MODIS. Uh, this is the rendering from across Kendrick Park. Um, it's a narrow deep site that is in between One East Pleasant and People's Bank. Uh, as I said on the planning board last week, it has a, a long history. Um, used, the People's Bank used to be a part of the same property. Um, and this, this parcel is five parcels that are owned by the Summerlin Trust, have been owned for um, um, a few decades in that capacity. Uh, we are developing four parcels on the south, which are Cousins Market and the Piper Building um, for 11 East Pleasant. And, 15 East Pleasant to the north is, um, is the, the former pub building. So this site is very narrow as it comes to the street. It's only 80 feet wide, roughly, um, and is very deep, uh, almost 300 feet deep on the north side. So uh, uh, the building here, as shown, is, um, approximately, is 60 feet wide, five stories tall. Uh, upper four floors are residential. Bottom floor is uh, retail. Uh, lobby, uh, parking, amenities, uh, utilities, and so on. Uh, as you can see, the building has the same uh, wood cladding as the uh, uh, One East Pleasant project next to it, which is Alaskan yellow cedar. And as we'll see in some of the additional renderings, um, 
uh, how we've managed the, uh, the cladding and the glazing and um, the materiality of the building. <clears throat> so here's the site plan showing that long deep site. Um, uh, and the uh, adjacency to One East Pleasant, uh, the approach that we've taken for a 60 foot building, which has landscaping on the south side, uh, the demolition of uh, the Piper building, which is approximately where the propane tank is, which will allow for views from the south end of Kendrick Park uh, all the way through back to the cemetery. Uh, this is the roof plan, so it shows the photovoltaics that we've proposed for the roof and the mechanical equipment behind it, including the energy recovery ventilators that we install in every building to give fresh air um, and the generator that we put on the roof, the elevator overrun, uh, the roof screen, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, the next is uh, from an architectural standpoint was showing where the building coverage and lot coverage uh, calculate out. And we've, re we've also submitted those same, uh, that same analysis on our civil plans, which we can go over if we need to. Um, this is the ground floor plan which shows uh, how we've chosen to try to break up that 276 foot long uh, site. Um, and effectively there's, uh, there's a retail facing the street. There's a lobby that's tucked in. There's a, a walkway that goes underneath the building that also interacts with the uh, uh, vehicular drive that comes in from an easement on the north uh, into the parking area, into the back where there's the parking spaces. Um, you can see the leasing office, fitness, mechanical, electrical, trash, storage, um, and you can see these um, teardrop shaped brick columns that are part of the structural element that we integrated architecturally um, as we could. You can also see here the retaining walls uh, that are in the southwest corner of the site. Um, and that helps us reconcile the grade difference between um, these downtown properties. So that uh, one East Pleasant is approximately 18 inches above uh, where 11 East Pleasant is. So as you're coming into the lobby here, um, you'll be, uh, we have to make the, the stormwater and the grades accessibility work out to the street. We also have to make those same things work out to the north where there's an easement. We can't obviously change any of the, uh, the grading along these north property lines. And so you'll see these retaining walls on the south that hold back the grade, allow for a secondary means of, of access dropping down and allows for the circulation to, to come through and, and break up the site. Um, you can see the down lights, the exterior lights that we've proposed, bower lights that we've proposed. Those down lights are identical to One East Pleasant next door. Um, I think as you can see, if you've been past our One East Pleasant project, uh, at night or in the winter that we have worked hard to keep the light levels very low um, while maintaining safety. And we would intend to do the same thing here. Um, the next uh, view is the upper floors of residential. So there's a double loaded corridor. Um, there's a, uh, a west stair and the main elevator. And then there's a east stair, janitor's closet, trash chute, electrical closet. And then the corridor is open to the east. Um, so that view goes out to the cemetery. Um, that is the same for the upper four, three floors uh, on the top floor, on the fifth floor. The only delta is there's a community room for tenants that is um, in the Northwest overlooking Kendrick Park. Uh, the roof uh, plan, like I've shown with the uh, uh, energy recovery ventilators, the generators, the condensing units, the solar panels and the elevator overrun. Um, these are the, this is the first sheet of elevations. So this top sheet B, B3 is the rendered elevation of the West, which is facing the street. You can see the, the cedar siding, uh, the glazing, and you can see the overhang that um, we've proposed to allow for more space on the ground floor um, and a little more accessibility to that retail space. And um, uh, you can also see on the, uh, D1, the rendered elevation of the north, um, the gash as we've called it, which allows the vehicular traffic to drive into the building and get back into the parking in the back. Uh, and also the, the pedestrian traffic to come through east, uh, north, south and uh, be able to enter the lobby and get behind uh, the retail. So um, um, let's see. You can also see here uh, on B3, the rendered elevation of the east. This is facing the cemetery. Whereas we've seen from the site visit, the grade is much higher in the cemetery because that's the historic grade of Amherst. And as you can see on the south, this is the elevation that's facing one East Pleasant. 
you can see the access through, you can see the site walls here, um, you can see the, the storefront that goes to the leasing office. This is the storefront for the lobby. This is the storefront for the retail. And these are the upper four floors of residential, which is a diverse mix of, of window units uh, that are operable, that are fixed, and then um, sliding patio units that have a Juliet balcony as we've done on other projects um, uh, downtown. This is a rendering, uh, aerial rendering from the Southwest. Uh, and, and, and the intent was to express some of our design intent, which was to eliminate the Piper building, which is back here, um, which prevents a view from the pedestrian level all the way through back to the cemetery. Um, so by opening that up and having a, you know, some scale to that, there'll be more of a connection back to that landscape behind Main Street, or behind, as it is Main Street, but behind Pleasant Street. Um, you can also see on the ground floor how we've had two different geometries, the geometry of the property line, and then the geometry, you know, this wall is perpendicular to that north property wall. And in doing so, we create um, a open, generous covered area that gives us a little more um, uh, usability all year round. It also is the entry point for the residential tenants that would come down this, uh, this exterior opened, open corridor that is covered by the building and that would take you back to the lobby behind. Um, you can see the site walls, you can see the Wooner uh, at One East Pleasant, which is pavers, and you can see that that materiality would be the same. We'd use the same paver, um, same location. You can start to see some of the materiality of the building where you have this, uh, the cedar, you have the zinc cladding, you have uh, the black windows, and you have the storefront that is all glass at the, at the ground level. You can also see the Peterson Tegel brick that we're proposing. Um, in the columns, it's, it's, it's oriented vertically and elsewhere on the first four walls, it's, it's a, a standard brick bond. Uh, a, pedest a, you know, a view, a similar view, but only from, you know, from five feet above grade uh, that gives you the sense of that view back to the cemetery, gives you the sense of that south facade and the west facade facing the street, shows you this, this walkway that would take you down back to the leasing office and the lobby that would bring you into the residential portion of the building, it does show you the drop in grade um, from uh, uh, the toy box down to People's Bank. You know, there's a six foot grade change. Most of that is reconciled where Glazed used to be, um, where we have that very steep sidewalk that has since been smoothed out. But um, you can see that uh, 11 East Pleasant is shorter than one East Pleasant. Uh, uh, up front, or a uh, close up detail of, of the uh, the cladding system that we've proposed. You can see the vertically installed cedar. Uh, you can see we, uh, there's four inches of insulation outboard of the sheathing. So it gives depth to the facade. Again, as we've, we've done in all of our downtown projects in the past, um, that additional insulation encapsulates the whole building uh, and gives depth, depth, depth around the windows, um, which we've tried to amplify uh, from a design stance so that uh, 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 the, the headers above the windows install the cedar horizontally. Uh, the brake metal is, is just above the windows uh, and then it's consistent below the windows and creates this, this horizontal line. You can see the zinc cladding uh, that, that, amp, that uh, uh, accentuates some of the openings and you can start to see some of the zinc cladding that would be between windows uh, running vertically. You can also see down below a wood ceiling proposed for the exterior for the retail and for the lobby. So that wood materiality continues under. You can see the bricks that are run vertically on those columns and you can see the black storefront behind. Uh, this is a view on the south facing One East Pleasant Courtyard. You can see the zinc as it comes up through this, this reveal where on the first floor, you can just kind of see it where you can walk through and, and the vehicular access is. You can see the Juliet balconies. Uh, and again, you can see some of the uh, uh, zinc cladding that is used between windows elsewhere in the facade. Um, on the north side facing People's Bank, you can see the horizontal installation of the brick um, on the back side of the lobby. Uh, you can see the bollards proposed. You can see uh, the storefront that is a pretty clean line with the bottom of the cedar. And again, you can see the, uh, the zinc uh, cladding between windows and the Juliet balconies. Um, uh, again, inside of the retail, uh, we've proposed a wood floor. Uh, we propose these brick columns run uh, with the brick running vertically are inside the storefront in some locations, 
outside the storefront, just at the entry to the pedestrian entry and just outside the vehicular entry. And you can see the materials that we're proposing. So the cedar rain screen, uh, the Rhine zinc, zinc cladding and the Peterson Tegel gray brick uh, that uh, we are proposing as the by far the three dominant materials for the building. Um, let me look, uh, I will pull up the landscape plan to show you the landscape plan is submitted. Uh, so this landscape plan shows again that there's this pedestrian walkway that, that takes you through. This is the uh, vehicular traffic that brings you into the ground floor. Uh, this is the, uh, the tree line that we're proposing to kind of draw the connection between the south end of Kendrick Park and the cemetery. This is where the Piper building gets removed. This is the landscaping that accommodates our infrastructure and the propane tanks because of the gas moratorium and the electrical transformer. Also the site walls and the granite boulder that we've proposed as a, a site element. Um, and I think, I think I'd probably stop there, uh, Maureen, unless you tell me otherwise. Okay. And you're still on mute, Maureen. Thank you. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think if that's all that uh, all the um, materials that you want to show the board now, you could show them the construction uh, lo uh, logistics plan if you haven't. Okay. Uh, here's the construction logistics plan. Um, so the intent is to utilize 15 uh, East Pleasant, which is the pub site as a, make sure that's smaller. Uh, sorry guys. So to utilize that as a staging ground that allows us to put a construction trailer, um, build mock-ups, uh, construction lay down, some limited parking. Uh, we would fence almost the entire perimeter including the spur out to Prey Street, would try to use all, Prey Street as the majority of the construction entrance and exit, would allow for the easement, which is also shared by People's United Bank to remain as free as possible. We'd have to use it some of the time, obviously, but um, would try to uh, reduce that as much as possible. Um, that fencing would allow for some state, some construction vehicles come off of Prey and wait on the property without sticking out into Prey Street. And, um, um, I think that's, I think that's probably about it for that. You can see where the trailer is located, the limited worker parking and the lay down area. Great. And, um, if you want to show them the, the shadow study, uh, that would be great. Okay. And I, yeah. and then I think that's, that's all. Okay. For... So we got a bunch of these. We'll start with summer. So this is June 21st, 2021. So hopefully you guys have seen these in some other context, but um, this is every 15 minutes. So this is showing at the summer solstice at 9 a.m. And all those change throughout the day. There's noon, there's one, there is three. So that's, that's at the, the sun at its highest. Um, I will now do winter. Sorry if that was too fast. <laughs> Just trying to not waste anybody's time. <clears throat> Here's winter showing nine, nine, 15, 10, 10 o'clock to three o'clock. That's with sun at its lowest. And I'm assuming that you guys have that. So I was just going through it to show everybody, but that everybody has a PDF of that. And I can go anywhere, any, the board would like me to go from there. Yeah, Catherine, would yeah. you like to have, uh, open it up to board discussion? Yeah. Yes, why don't we do that? Um, and uh, if there, <clears throat> excuse me, if any public 
um, is uh, listening, you will have a public will have a chance to make comments. But right now, it's the board's turn to ask questions, uh, get clarification, uh, and then we will be going through the design standards um, uh, eventually. But right now, this maybe we'll just try to keep these uh, more or less general. And uh, if we don't get uh, specific responses, we can perhaps wait until we get to the uh, design standards. So having said that, um, panel members. I have a question about the shading. I really appreciate you including the solar study. That was very helpful, pretty dramatic difference. Um, um, so I'm a little concerned about just the shading on those trees and um, you know, I, I just pulled up an image of the Armstrong maple. It looks like they have kind of more of a narrow profile. So I understand them working well in that location in terms of their canopy shape. Um, two points, one is just to um, verify that they would be able to maintain that kind of low level of light for you know half of the year or whatever it ends up being um, uh, to make sure that they don't, you know, that they can, they can be their fullest and not look like they're suffering. Um, and the second is to see if it might be worth considering a second um, tree just to give a little more variation so it doesn't look like, um, you know, as uniform of a row of, of landscaping as it might with just a single tree type. And if you've looked at that, thank you. Yep, um, I think that we've, we've currently, that, that property line where the trees are proposed is currently planted with a flowering shrub that is doing quite well. So I think that um, we don't have concerns that the tree will be on, will have, will, won't have enough light to thrive. I think it all comes down to how well you prep the hole and uh, how well, you know, how much, uh, how much room you have the root ball, how much room you give the root ball to grow. Um, I think the intent was to keep the plant palette pretty limited so that we'd have the red twig dogwoods that we've used elsewhere that, that work very well downtown and they're very robust. They can get beat up. Uh, they can come back. They give some winter color with the red. They give the flowers. They give uh, the greenery you know, for an extended period. So keep those as the ground plane that can get pretty robust, three, four, five feet. Um, and then allow the, the columnar Armstrong maples to, to kind of march down 15, 18 feet on center uh, down, uh, down that south side. So the intent was to keep it somewhat limited from a plant palette standpoint um, so that it, it reads very clear and ties in with the plant palette on the um, other side of uh, One East Pleasant in the, in the uh, courtyard. Yeah, I had the same question that Lindsay did about the row of, of maples, because I, in one respect, it, I think it's, uh, a really great idea to, to have that. And I like the fact you've left that opening towards the cemetery, but the uh, shade uh, studies that you did, I thought it showed that, that along that side of the building, the south side of the building, there was shade all the time, but you're, you're satisfied that um, there's gonna be enough sun to maintain those maples uh, because they're gonna cost a lot to put in and they're beautiful trees, but you studied your own. <laughs> yes. And, study. Yeah. And, and like I said, there are, there are currently shrubs that are in that location that are doing just fine. Right in there. Sure. Right. Uh, okay. And the shade we're talking about is from one East Pleasant, not from the new project. All right. Okay. Okay. Other questions? From just as a follow-up to that. Sorry, sure. I'll be done in a second. So the dogwoods that you're proposing, are those shown on your site plan? The red twig dogwoods, yeah, they're all on the landscape. They're they're small, so they're it's a you know the red flowering shrub that's that starts about this big, um, and it's what we've installed at One EP. Okay, can you just point to where those might be, just in terms of the it's site? A, uh, landscape plan? They show them most clearly. Uh, it's it's uh, labeled as site plan. Um, oh, that one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you give me a second, it's on sheet uh, L one dot zero. Okay, thank you. You're gonna pull that up, Maureen, or, 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 or just referring us to, because we, I think we got that from mm -hmm. you. Okay, all right, okay. Lindsay, do you have any other comments now? Not related to that, okay. thank you. Okay, um, other members of the board? 
Anybody have any? I, I do. I don't, are we being Eric. called upon tonight? Sorry. Yes, <laughs> Erica. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. I really appreciate it, Kyle and Dave. Um, I'm wondering if you could uh, clarify for us um, some of the decisions about uh, the retail space. Um, there's a single space, it's about 1400 square feet. Um, I'm just wondering about the your market study, if you will, of that. I know that there's been um, from in our, Maureen, are you? I just want to uh, remind the the design review board members and and, and uh, Chris uh, can interject if she wishes is that the, you know the jurisdiction of the DRB is really um, external changes. Um, you can talk about internal building items if it relates to the ex it, to the exterior, okay. but um, sort of. Mm, no, I appreciate that, but yeah. I could argue that in this case it it does because I think that if it were um, sure. two smaller spaces or if it uh, if the uh, vertical circulation were to move, that that would have an impact on the exterior of the building. So I was just wondering about the um, appropriateness of a single small smallish retail space and what you could tell us about what went into that decision. Sure. Um, so the site is very narrow as it faces the street. So I think um, obviously the, the place for retail is along the street. So what one of the earliest design decisions we, ma we made was how do we give that all up to the retail rather than split that with the lobby, which is often the case. And so in order to do that, we had to pull the lobby off of the street and bring it back you know, to the back of that building. And then Obviously, where the lobby is, is where the vertical circulation is, meaning the elevator and the egress stair and the mailboxes and the package room and the bath, all that other stuff that goes along with it. So the desire to split that ground floor, um, we want to do that in the location that would continue a pedestrian experience off of the street, off of East Pleasant and, and have about that 60 foot depth to it. Um, on the upper floors for the residential, you're limited at the end of a dead end corridor. So you can only have 50 feet from the end of a corridor to, to your, uh, your stair. So uh, that, that places our stair and our elevator in that front half. And in doing so, what we try to do is make sure that we gave all of the retail over to the front, the, the street facing part of the retail, all to the retail and kept as little as we needed to for that lobby in the, in the, in the back half. So the other side of that is obviously the ground floor, there's a lot of program there. There's retail, there's lobby, there's uh, parking, there's storage, there's mechanical, there's trash, there's all these things that we all that we have to balance. And we had many different sketches as we look to try to put together the best puzzle piece, um, uh, trying to manage all that. Erica, other questions? No. Okay. Well, I like to piggyback on that on the retail space. Um, I'm, uh, I understand having just limitations for size. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of comment around town about you know, two and three and four retail spaces, but um, Jeff Bezos is taking care of that for you. And I think the future of retail is so questionable. So, um, so I can understand maybe one's okay. But it, I'm not sure that the design of it being away from the sidewalk and then with a sort of a, a cantilever over it is going to be the easiest way for a retailer to, to design an interesting front door and a sign. Um, I, I think it works to the retailer's disadvantage the way in which it has been designed and not sure that it's going to attract people. Um, because it's just it's not it's such a small and so in, insignificant location for a retail um, establishment. I wondered if you had considered having the retail more aligned with the uh, closer to the sidewalk so it would stand out. Uh, we, we did look at that. We looked at bringing the retail all the way to the property line. Yeah. Um, 
it obviously would put that storefront glass right against the folks walking on the sidewalk, which yeah. is kind of cool. I do think that it's a very unique location in town because east and west side of Kendrick Park all come together there at the at, at the right across the street from this property. Um, the bus stop is right across the street from this property. The north end of downtown really begins uh, right at this property. So I think that the the traffic, um, the uh, visibility of this site is going to be there regardless of if it's uh, if we put that storefront out to the to the property line or if we pulled it back like we did. Um, I think the other approach that we took was to make it as glassy as we could. Um, and so therefore the whatever's happening in that space is going to be very apparent. It's not going to be tucked away behind brick columns or tucked away behind um, you know something else. It's whatever's happening there is going to be very apparent to the street. It's going to have to be managed. Um, but I think what that does is makes best use of a site that's inherently limited by its width. And so all we can talk about is how deep do we go on that on that retail? You know, we can't go 115 feet wide because the site's only 80. The building's only 60. So we've used 52 of that for retail. And then it's just how deep can uh, can you make that? So I think your point about you know, the future of retail is very real. Obviously, we've gone through a very difficult time for retail in the last 15 months. Um, and I think it's, um, you know, I think, again, we tried to do something that we thought was the best fit. Also, I might add that uh, that's the entrance to our, our, our lobby, our residential lobby, which we intentionally put back so to get as much retail as we possibly could. So it's an invitation to walk undercover back to undercover and to our lobby, which is on the east side of that first building. So is there any uh, plan for that area, that open area as you go down into your, as you approach the retail and then the lobby, um, is there room there for benches or any kind of amenities that might, uh, attract people, want to go and sit. Um, and the other question is the space between the two, the new building and the uh, adjoining building, looks like it's 10 to 12 feet wide. Uh, your sketches would lead one to think it's a wider area. I see people standing around, little sketches of people. and uh, I'm not sure. 12 feet holds everything that uh, you, your architects have sketched in there. Um, could you review the, that aspect of the plan? Sure. Uh, all the renderings we've presented are based on a Revit model. The Revit model is the basis of the um, uh, building permit. So it's all accurate in okay. terms of, of, of that model. It is 10 feet to 12 feet from the yeah. property line. Yeah. But there is the dry aisle and the wound earth and the plantings and the walkway to one East Pleasant. So okay. that space is much, much wider. All right. Um, and 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 that's reflected on the back side of the property where the Piper building currently stands. And that would be the view through. So I think you while you'll be walking under a space that's approximately eight feet wide that's covered as you're going back past the retail to the lobby. To your right will be the the site walls that could be seating, but it's not formal. It's right. informal, uh, and the plantings and the landscaping, and then the, the curb to the drive aisle and one East Pleasant. And so there is there is uh, a bit more space there between the buildings. Okay, okay, thank you. Can I just um, yes. say, Catherine, that I appreciate your concern about visibility, but I really like the way that the angle <clears throat> changes between the two walls, the upper and lower wall, and um, I think it, it's, it's sharp and it, it creates much more visual interest than the flat facade, for instance, of your other building next door. Um, I also just go out on a limb here. I know that there's concern in town about more five-story buildings and filling up spaces, but that's not really our purview. I just want to say I like this design a lot better than your other two buildings. Um, I think it's quieter. Um, a little more elegant and sophisticated. It's more Bauhaus than um, the other two are. It just, um, just I think it's just more pleasant to look at and it, it fits the narrowness of the site really nicely. So I just wanna, um, you know, to say I appreciate the, um, the look of this building and, you know, whether or not we should have buildings like this uh, is not really up to us, um, but just in terms of 
the design and the way it looks from the street and the way you've used the side between the other building, um, how it how it reacts to the cemetery in the back is still kind of an issue for me with those trees and all. But otherwise, I, I think it's a, a really nice presentation um, of the space. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, any other, uh, Tom, do you have any uh, comments at this time? Yeah, I do. Um, Kyle, nice to see you again. How are you? Nice to see you. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a couple of quick questions. One is that I'm um, looking on page uh, PR 2.01, um, you're describing the elevation of the building as, and actually the previous one, 57 feet. I just want to verify that. I'm sorry, for the height? Yeah. Uh, yes. As noted in the elevation? Yeah, okay. As noted in the elevation. All right. Um, and then I had another question about, um, and this is maybe following up on, on what you were just discussing with Catherine in terms of visibility, but um, will there be any signage, wayfinding numbers, uh, any way to direct people either A, towards the, the, the retail, or would there be a punch out for retail anywhere, sign band, anything of that sort, as well as any wayfinding to get people to the residential if they've never visited this location before? I guess people who live there would probably find it, but um, would people who um, are visiting have uh, an easy way to find this entrance? Uh, good questions. I think the signage for the retail is to be determined. Obviously, we don't have a sign band anywhere in the building for that. So I think it would be integrated uh, within the storefront, the glazing or behind the glazing or a blade sign that maybe is hanging underneath the wood somehow, some way to draw attention to it. Okay. Um, that'll obviously very much depend on what the tenant is at, at the yeah. future date. Okay. Uh, we did, we've talked about signage to, you know, to bring people back. I think we obviously have to have a number for fire. Uh, you know, an address that needs to be prominent so everybody knows where and, and, and mail so everybody knows where they're going. I think from a residential side, though, that the intent is that that lobby is going to be lit 24 seven, right, because it's part of the egress. Um, so manage the light levels in that lobby well. Uh, the leasing office across the way is going to be lit and we're going to be able to manage that. So manage that well. Um, there may be some vinyl signage or something on the leasing office that might, you know, have some name associated with it. Um, but we haven't, we haven't flushed that out. I don't think it would be anything other than some surface treatment, um, okay. somewhere either on the storefront or on the glass. Okay. So nothing wayfinding standalones that'll be out by the street to direct people around. I don't know. I mean, I'm, just, I'm just asking, cause I want to know if it's something yeah, no, to look forward it, to. Right? I think, I think it's, it, there's, there's two, right? There's retail and residential. I think the retail is going to be solved all on the storefront. Yeah. So, we'll have to see that later. Right. That'll be, that'll be later when we know more about what's going in there. The residential piece, I don't think there's any wayfinding that says, if you're a tenant, come back here. I think it's going to be a situation where um, there's an address, people under, you know people know the building, and um, by lighting and perhaps, perhaps by some vinyl that is back on the leasing office, there's something that, that pulls people back there. And I think as, as, uh, as we've discussed, I think some of the moves on the, on the ground floor in terms of how we pull back the storefront and have this overhang to walk through, are inherently going to lead people um, back towards the, the entrance to the residential portion of the building. Okay. Thank you. I have, a, I have a third comment, and I've been looking at this building for a little while now. <laughs> it's my second time around, but um, you know, I I really appreciate it. I really appreciate everyone's comments about you know how it's different from the other buildings that were there uh, or that you you put up, and and there's something really. Um, elegant about this compared to your other buildings. But one of the things that keeps coming up is that uh, every time I look at it, especially through um, view PR01 page on uh, the sort of view from Kendrick Park, what we don't see is a view from further down the road. And, and my concern here is that One East Pleasant broke up that North facade by having a courtyard. And this building is a, is a solid wall. And, and it's, you know, because it's not your fault that your site is adjacent to the sea of asphalt and this mini, you know, one story building, but, but I have a real concern that for years to come, there's this massive wall that's unbroken. And, and I'm not saying that I, it's, a, it's a deal breaker for me, but it feels really, it feels really strange to A, never see that view 
I think that view is going to be the, 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 the deal breaker for me, sort of looking north into the town, uh, looking south into town. And on the left, you know, right side of the street, we have a park on the left side, we have this wall. And, and I guess the, the reason I'm bringing it up isn't necessarily because I think you need to deconstruct your building or take it down, or I, I'm not concerned about the height, but I do think that there could be um, an indent. There could be, you know, you could remove a few feet here and there to break up that facade, maybe where your gash is so that it, you know, looks like two pieces at a distance. Is there a material change that can happen to break this up? into smaller pieces it just feels so monolithic and 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 again it's because of the context this isn't an infill you know it's adjacent to the sea of asphalt that everyone's going to see and it's a billboard for you know the the walk downtown so i would love to see that wall addressed in some other way besides the monolithic monolithic use of one material so i have a concern about that and i'd love to hear your thoughts on it and whether or not that's something that might be worth examining um, from your perspective. Uh, sure, I think, as you said, you know, the site is very deep. Um, uh, we are one property uh, south of Prey Street. Um, to the north is a one-story bank, and then on one side, and also a laundromat, and um, some other properties that obviously are um, much smaller than the master plan, seeks or then the zoning bylaw says that the town of Amherst is looking to have in the future. So that, you know, this project is, 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 is the latest project, but obviously in 2050, right, uh, downtown Amherst is going to look different than it does in 2020. Um, so I think that in terms of this site, like we said, it's very narrow, uh, trying to work with that site and, and, and make it work. Um, uh, has has led to this this shape that has a head and a tail somewhat from a design standpoint. Um, we've tried to highlight that as much as we can um, with the with the the gash on the on the north side and you know the the rectangular you know uh, recess on the south side. Um, and we've we looked at that a bunch of different ways again in in our design process. And um, what we've settled on is this is is something that recognizes the reality of the site now, recognizing that in the future there'll be something else, and then it and and then uh, you know uses the the cedar, the zinc, and the brick in in a combination that we think allows for you know the the composition to you know to work to work well. Um, so I think that the you know it's a it's a very unique part of town in between you know Pleasant Street and the cemetery. Um, there is no walkway through, um, you know, there's never going to be a walkway through that gate on the cemetery is solid because there are graves on the other side. So the entrance to the cemetery is always going to be the Gaylord Gate or on, on Prey Street. And so it is, it is kind of a dead end at the end of this. And, um, you know, like I said, we've, we, we feel like we've, we've tried to put together a, uh, a puzzle that, that we feel proud of in terms of that, how to best use that, that long facade. Yeah, and I guess I, I guess I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm not even disagreeing with the proportions of the building. I'm not. I, I think um, I could imagine your head and tail being slightly different materials, and I can imagine some gesture, the you know, in that change of materials. Maybe it's the change in the orientation of the clapboards. I don't. Know. I'm, I guess what I'm saying is that. Um, we are, you know, yes, in 2050 it's going to look different, but in 2030 and probably 2040 it's going to look the same and we're going to be looking at this wall and and I, I want I just I want I guess I want archipelago to acknowledge that and and consider um, a way to break up that facade if it's possible well I I think we we do acknowledge it I think that if that still looks the same in 2040 then we're not doing our job with the housing production that our community needs to to make um, so but acknowledging, you know, we've tried to break up the, the, that cladding with this horizontal brake metal. Um, we've looked at a bunch of different cladding options and we felt strongly that the, the strong move of the Alaskan yellow cedar and the zinc and the brick as we put it was the best foot forward. Tom, just to play devil's advocate with you, sorry. Um, I think that some of the way that the facades have broken up on the other buildings is actually visually um, busy and distractive and, 
I prefer, maybe it's a wall, but it might also be that it's so un um, articulated that it's easy to look past it to not notice it as much. So, you know, you can, I'm sorry, my cat is trying to tell us. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's, it's on the one hand, it's a wall, but on the other hand, it doesn't jump out and say, notice this, notice this, notice this part. It's just quietly there. It's, it's, it's a beautiful like, wall. I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that I think that, but that's part of the problem. And I think the fact that we don't have a view looking south from the roundabout is telling. And I think I'd like to see that view before I can say this is the right idea for town. Yeah, but I just sure makes wanted nice. have, wouldn't want it to have all these sections like they do where they do sort of a faux townhouse look or yeah. something like, or even like the other one with the brick and whatever that would make you stop and notice it rather than continuing to look south, you know, would become, I don't know, and sort of annoying after a while. And, and we, you're muted, Tom. Sorry, I, I, from an architectural perspective, I very much like the object nature of this building. And I'm trying to look at it from an objective perspective, suggesting that maybe not everybody wants the monolith in town. So like, I think, I think I'd like to see it from that perspective, understanding that that roundabout is gonna be a gateway to town and you already pass the corner when you arrive there. And that's the first thing you see when you come into Amherst. You have a park on one side and a monolith on the other. And I wanna make sure that that's what we want our town to see when we arrive. But think of the people who lived there in those buildings. You had this lovely courtyard that's created. It's almost uh, European in a sense. And we don't have that any place in the downtown. And people are allowed to walk in there with this view of the cemetery. So I, I think you need to think on kind of like the, 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 this being a combination of, of buildings gathered around a courtyard with a view to the cemetery from Kendrick Park. Anybody driving into town from, from, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from, from UMass couldn't care less about what they saw in the distance. I, 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 I'm telling you, you as an architect see that, but, and we do too, but 99.44% of anybody else is just driving through downtown. <laughs> Well, and I, I think that, Tom, we can absolutely show additional renderings, right? We can absolutely show renderings from anywhere. It's been modeled. It's Revit. You can, we can, we can, uh, you know, we can show you this building from any angle we want and, and, and then have that, that conversation. Dave, they may, you know, whether or not they care architecturally, the, the view they get influences their perception of the town. So, I mean, it doesn't really matter whether they are sophisticated architectural critics, what they, they see Kendrick Place, and then they're gonna see a couple of small buildings and then they'll see that. And whether or not they actually look at them critically, it's still how Amherst appears to them. And I think this is what Tom's concerned about. And I, I think it's a, I think Tom brings up a good point. And I think that that is the conversation for all of North Downtown, right? That North Downtown is, is a very unique stretch of land in New England. Um, <laughs> Uh, it is, it is a, a wonderful opportunity and it is less than 1% of the land mass. So if we're going to be doing anything there um, and we're going to be serious about, you know, how much housing we need in this town, then it's going to be, uh, there's going to be density. And so if you just project density as the town has done in many studies over time in terms of what the north end of downtown would look like, assuming the Tan Brook and different ownership and town ownership of a parking lot and Prey Street and all these other things and utilities, that there's going to be some math, mass to it. I think using the term monolith is, is, um, is one way to, to term it, one way to explain it. I think using, you know, saying it's a five-story building is another. And I think that's what the north end of downtown um, should be over time. Yeah. I, I guess what I first see is a purple building. <laughs> The only one in Western Mass, as I know of right now, when Not I drive to the downtown. <laughs> Not for long. Can I ask a clarifying question to our, our chair and or Maureen? Um, we started this time as um, asking clarifying questions. Have yes. we moved into design review board comments about form and proportion and yes, landscape right. and such? Yeah. Okay. Um, we, could save, we could save these comments and go into our points, if that's what you're 
Sort yeah, of. I just I just want to make sure that, like I'd love to add to this conversation because yeah. I agree with Tom, but if this isn't the right time, I just right. need some direction yeah. from you. Yeah. As... So I, I okay, I think that's a good point. And uh it's easy to get into the weeds <clears throat> because we can bring those up um uh, in our discussion. And so Maureen, uh according to our agenda um it is time if everybody agrees it would be time to bring in any public uh comments uh, uh, oh uh, catherine i believe erica wa wanted to wanted oh, to see if, she, if if the board can talk about the design standards yes of course uh this is uh please do um so yeah um, we were going to go to those uh but uh i thought by our agenda we were going to have public comment now or um, I just want a clarification about this. Oh, issue. sure. Uh, we could start a public comment um, maybe at um, 6.15. Does that work? 6.20, okay. something like that? Or whenever, um, um, or if the board ends earlier. Okay. But um, All right. well, yeah, if can... Erica wants to uh, speak about this project as it relates to the design review board standards and principles, Why don't we do please, that? please go ahead. Okay, right. let's, okay, then let's go to our standards. Uh, and everybody can follow along. Um, I, I don't um, think that you need to go, you know, line um, okay. uh, item by item. But yeah, um, well, so I think we do need to go item by item to keep ourselves organized for the design review board. We're obliged to do our design um, standards. And I'm saying, should we do them now or should we bring the public in? Um, I think it's okay to just have a sort of open uh, conversation about any topics as it relates to the design review board. And I think when the board makes its ultimate recommendations, that then that would be the opportunity to go um, item by item. Okay, okay, sure. So uh, where are we then? <laughs> any other, uh, are we, yeah. go ahead. Okay, <laughs> so. Sorry, um, Erica. <laughs> but no, I just, thank you for the clarification, I think. Um, I think this is great. I do. I have a, a short. I have a short list. Um, and just to start off with, um, where the conversation just was, um, I agree with Tom that the the north facade of the building, um, actually, I mean, it, I think it's well designed. The window um, proportions are are delightful. I'm really appreciating the the use of wood. I think that it's. Um, Jan may have used the word softer um, building than some of the others. Um, I think there's a lot to like about it. And with, just with regard to that north elevation though, I think that it is, um, it is long, it is repetitive, and there could be some, uh, dare I say, simple or easy ways to use your palette of materials in particular um, around the um, fire stair the egress stair that is located to the, no, I'm disoriented. Uh, to, to the, the east there. To the, yeah, to the east. That, you know, maybe you could use zinc cladding there. I, I'm guessing you wouldn't want to make the move of um, indenting it. Your, all of your zinc is used at places where you've pushed into the volume. Um, mm -hmm. But if that were to happen, that would be great. And I think, you know, it's kind of a simple move that doesn't say, let's redesign this entire facade, but maybe you can articulate and then break it up into kind of head, abdomen, and tail. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that the the gash, as you're referring to it, is is a really nice design move. It's something that picks up, um, you know, a, a, the porosity at the ground floor and carries it up the building. But when it reduces on the top two floors to only two feet seven, it's pretty ineffectual. Um, I think it's not bringing light to those windows per se. Um, and from that distance, from the, from the car, right, from the street or from the pedestrian's point of view on the sidewalk, it's not gonna have a lot of effect. And if you could hold it at the place where that diagonal comes up and meets at the third floor line so that it's more closer to maybe 10 feet, it would cause some changes to the bedrooms on the top two floors. But I think that that widening of that cut would be a really effective move to help to give some uh, breathing space there between the head and the tail. 
Um, so if that's something that you'd be willing to consider, I think it, it might help to address um, some of the concerns about that the continuous or monolithic um, north, north face. Well, I, um, just, just real quickly on that, um, we, we, we did look at that. We've looked at this facade in a number of different iterations. Um, obviously the, the egress stair was one place to bring in a different material that works quite well. Um, what we found is it really started to take away from what we thought was the strong, you know, the strong design move of the, the, the front portion and, and the separation and, and the back portion. Um, also tried to tie that into to the cladding, the wood cladding rising up as the grade goes back to the higher portion in the cemetery. So we did look at that. We just felt like, again, that the, the bigger move, the stronger move was more effectual. So um, also looked at the gash in a number of different iterations. Um, all different widths, how it impacts interior, how it doesn't, how you have light, and and started squeezing it to really kind of, um, we thought it was the it was the uh, the right approach for the proportions and how the interior is going to be lit and how that was going to um, take place. So we have looked at these things. It's just that we've you know when we were trying to you know finish the design of this building and bring it forward, um, this is just where we where we uh, settled. Yeah, I would argue that that cut's going to be pretty much irrelevant by the time you're looking at it from from the sidewalk distance um i and if i i have you know my my list is is short so um i also um really appreciate the the space you're giving at the front of the building um for pushing back the 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 retail um edge i think it's an important urban move to receive halleck street there at the end and like you mentioned there's the bus stop and I'm actually wondering if you could um, expand the the paved surface a little bit and maybe push the grass back just a little. So, you know, it would maybe involve moving the retaining wall back to just give a little bit more breathing room there. And then to make sure that the, the height of that first retaining wall is at seating height. 18 inches, yeah. Um, yeah, so, and I know, I think I heard you mention on our, site walk that some of the walls would be at three feet high. And I can see why you wouldn't want to encourage a lot of activity deeper into the site, especially, you know, down at the back. But um, there at the front, I think that would be a nice gesture to lower that one so that people can actually occupy that space and take a break on the sidewalk and, you know, tie their shoes or, or whatever. Um, so, um, yeah, let's see. And what else was my... Oh, I'm a little bit concerned about um, pedestrian safety at the place where the cars are gonna be moving in underneath that cut. And if there was any way to distinguish <clears throat> the paving surface um, or perhaps an additional bollard or something to indicate that there should be some distinction between where people walk because you are encouraging cutting through mm -hmm. and where cars are driving in and out. Uh... Understood. Um, you know, we've tried to take the paver all the way through and have that continuous. We haven't looked at altering the paver pattern um, or if that would be enough to telegraph that. Um, obviously with the angle, there's not, there's not high speed there um, because in order to, you know, to, to turn in and, and get in, there requires some negotiation. Um, it works with turning radius and everything, but um, it's not a high speed corner. Um, uh, I think that, you know, could there be some signage on the bollards or some signage on that brick column that is exposed in between the pedestrian and the vehicular potentially? Uh, and that might, that might uh, just be another key, besides walking past the bollards, might be another key that, that alerts folks that that's where the, the cars and the people have to play nicely together, as they do at One East Pleasant. Mm -hmm. Of others, Erica. No, I'll I'll cede to other members of the design review board. For now. Okay, we'll get back to of some of these. Uh, Lindsay, hi. <laughs> so, um, no, I I echo what other board members have said. I think that you've made a lot of really informed and 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 well well articulated decisions on this building overall. Um, but I also agree that it it would. 
I would really welcome the opportunity to see a little bit more of the zinc um, and those reveals. And so I understand that design is an arduous process um, firsthand and you've already made it this far and you don't wanna go back and you've looked at well more than we have. So I respect that. Um, and you have a better sense of what, what does and doesn't work. Um, that being said, it's our, you know, it's our first time seeing um, a rendition of, of how it all comes together. And I think that <clears throat> um, Tom and Erica's points about the North facade um, offer some, some rationale for perhaps considering other moments where you can continue to do what you've already done. And um, I, I do like Erica's suggestion of considering that zinc at the stair. I, I would just looking at it myself, thought the same thing before she made the comment that that's a location where it feels like it would be really nice to have a break, just a visual, something again, subtle. It could be a small break, but I think um, you have the material palette to do something there that might really help um, the eye just have a little, a moment of rest or a moment of transition. Um, and then the, the only other location, um, and I do also agree with her about the width of that slot, but um, maybe maybe that's less of a concern because I think that the the break um, that you've created, that kind of like tear um, is a really nice gesture and, and indicates where that opening is. And I, I really appreciate that. <clears throat> the only other location where I feel like um, I would be curious to see how you how you could um, create more visual interest is on the south facade. Um, this is both from a functional interior standpoint as well as from an aesthetic exterior standpoint, which is at the end of the the, the west end of the corridor, <clears throat> where you have um, on the east side you have a a view all the way through, and on the west side that ends at a a unit, which is a bedroom for one of the, the units on the west side. Um, and I, I certainly don't want to suggest that you take away um, valuable bedroom space, because I know that's an important feature, but it would be lovely if there was a way to create a continuous view through and some kind of, I don't know how wide your corridors are, but five to six foot um, exterior transition in and have that that location of the corridor be expressed and that kind of like view through the building where you really do have a break um, on all the floors above the ground floor be expressed through a material change that would really be interesting to see on the south side. So those are the two locations where I think um, I would be curious to see what that does for the building. Um, so that's my suggestion and whether or not there's a reveal it would be nice if there could be, but just even transitioning materials, I think, could be lovely. <clears throat> Secondly, um, I think my my only other real two two minor exterior questions. One is on the. Um, I understand you can't extend the parapet height any further, but um, just looking at some of the elevations, it, it indicates that there's that uh, mechanical screen, and some of those are. Um, more porous to the eye than others. And so um, it looks like on, on the longer facades, that screen is, <clears throat> is pretty effective at, um, at eclipsing the mechanical units, but on the south side, maybe less so. And that seems to be, you know, certainly from the park, there will be a lot of views um, toward that, that parapet and above. So I just wanna encourage that whatever that screen is, is um, as, concealing and um, uh, sightly as possible, especially from the kind of long distance view of Kendrick Park. Um, and then lastly, uh, the bollards that you show, I think those are those are nice. I wonder if there might be a, an alignment with the mullions. This is like a really nitpicky design question. Um, your mullions appear to be rel relatively evenly spaced along that um, north facade. Uh, it might be nice if they had some kind of rhythm that aligned with the mullions or the paving or both. Um, so I would just suggest looking at that. Again, it's a very minor comment, but it could be, it could have a nice effect. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bestrup would like to speak. Am I being recognized? Yes. 
Yes, <laughs> there you. you are. Yes. I just wanted to point out that I think there is some room to make the parapet wall higher um, because since it's not enclosing a habitable space, um, it actually doesn't count as far as the building height. So I would encourage um, Kyle and his um, designers to look at uh, how the how the height is measured and um, to uh, realize that there are certain um, items that are not uh, included in the height. Um, and I think it would be section 6.172 of the zoning bylaw that you could look at. It says height limitations shall not apply to chimneys, spires, cupolas, TV antennae, or other parts of buildings or structures not intended for human occupancy. So um, I remember that when um, Kuhn Riddle and um, the building, the property owners proposed a building on, at the corner of Halleck Street and North Pleasant Street, um, they did have a parapet wall that was pretty high. I think it might have been as high as three feet. And the purpose of it was to um, enclose some things on the roof, but it was also to you know, make the building look better in their design. And they were um, allowed to do that because of this uh, way of um, judging the building height. So I just wanted to point that out in case that would be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments from the design review board that we haven't picked up? I, I did have a couple of comments. Um, I'm agreeing with Tom and others about the wall. That causes me a lot of concern and I'm sorry that the architects didn't make some attempt to create some breaks in the um, length of the building. And as Jan said, you, you don't wanna turn it into something tacky. Uh, and I'm not sure sticking up different materials here and there will work, but I think some of the suggestions uh, should be taken uh, uh, seriously. Um, I have a question about the yellow cedar. And I don't know, Kyle, if you have talked to people about the history of the wear of that kind of wood, uh, because I, one thought comes to my mind after 10 years, it's gonna start looking really, kind of bad, maybe breaking down or the colors going to, to uh, dissipate. Um, what's your, what do you know? What's your best uh, understanding of the cedar for, because you've got so much the building cedar? Sure. Uh, so the Alaskan yellow cedar, the way we found out about the material was on a site visit to Cambridge where Renzo Piano had just uh, was the fog museum edition was under construction and we saw a bundle of this wood and um, looked at it and came back and saw all the studies that they had done to find the right wood to do this cladding of this building in Boston. And they settled on Alaskan yellow cedar because of its density, because of its the clarity of the grain, because of its ability to age gracefully. Um, and then the, the stain that we've deployed is the same is a similar stain that they've used. So uh, the Kendrick Place project has this on it. Um, when we installed that, uh, we used a oil-based stain uh, from Cabot called a bleach, uh, bleaching oil. We've since shifted that. Cabot has discontinued that project. We're using a water-based stain that pre-grazed the, the Alaskan yellow cedar as we did at One East Pleasant. Um, what that does is it, it gets it through its ugly duckling phase and gets it to a natural wood material uh, gracefully. Uh, so I think that in terms of wood cladding, which I think is, you know, something that we're going to try to do more of in the future. I think it's important um, as a material. I think it does a lot of positive things uh, that we're all very well aware of. Um, that coming up with the right wood that will, you know, exist well in the New England environment was important to us. And I think that Alaskan yellow cedar with the Cabot uh, water-based bleaching oil gives us that that best opportunity. Okay, so you don't anticipate that you would have to treat it every so often um, just to maintain that rich uh, color that it's going to have when you build the building? 
I think I think that the wood material is inherently natural. There's inherently, um, if you go look at the Fog Museum today, there's inherently going to be some variation. It's not going to be uniform. We're not painting it. It's not a solid body stain that we're trying to cover it up. Um, so the intent is that there's richness in that aging process. Um, there's richness even in the cedar here. Um, that there's delta between there's you know the the colors of the wood. So. The intent is not to be resurfacing this or re-staining it every five years at all. Um, the intent is to put it up and and put up a robust material that has the, you know, the proper stain to help it begin its life and then allow it to, you know, to age and and uh, and be graceful. And I think in the future we're going to see uh, more of that as as cladding on buildings around the country. Okay. Okay. Then one other thing that. Um, uh, does relate to design sort of indirectly. Uh, you do have some limited parking uh, that's been built into your design, um, but I think the thinking will be that there are many people that are going to have cars and we're going to want to have to park their car. This is going to come up again and again, so it might be good just to have your thoughts about that now because You've designed a building with limited parking, meaning that there are going to be cars looking for places to park. And what do you, what will you be telling your residents um, about where to park and how to park, uh, given that you have a limited number in your building? Uh, I think that in our approach to downtown is we think it's really important to get housing units downtown. Um, we think that um, you know, the, uh, by having people, you have the most robust ground floor, you have the most robust uh, retail environment that you can have that it can compete with all the stuff it needs to compete with these days, whether it's online or on the strip down the road. Um, and I think that there is always going to be, as, as our country goes through, uh, you know, a, a big housing boom here in, in certain markets, uh, you're going to see this trade-off between housing units and parking. And every municipality has to figure out where they are with that. And I think that, um, you know, there's a, uh, we've tried to come up with what we think is the best balance to that. Um, and have, and, you know, obviously, even though we're within the municipal parking district, uh, trying to provide parking on the ground floor uh, to do that. Uh, we don't want to do all parking because then we don't have retail. We don't want to do all retail because then we don't have parking. Um, so we've we've tried to you know do the right mix and continue to to bring folks to live downtown. Yeah. So uh, in other words, uh, they'll just have to find themselves a place. Yeah. I mean, I hear you. I mean, I think everybody understands this, but uh, with the increasing density downtown and more cars and fewer parking spaces, um, we're gonna. Uh, Amherst is going to continue to have a problem. It's going to be perceived as a problem, even if it isn't, but I do think it's a problem. So just wanted to bring that up, just something for the record. And then just one other thing, we're talking with Tom about designing for, are we designing for now or are we designing for the future? Because now uh, we're going to have this very long building um, and, uh, this is what people are going to see. And we, it's a it's challenge to say, but wait 10 years, there'll be another big building and then you won't see that building. Um, I think we have to keep in mind that this is what people are seeing now. And um, that's still a challenge. So, okay, well, I, any other, I'm sorry. Catherine, just to answer your question, we have to design for both. We have to design for now and we have to design for the future. Um, I think that now, is um, uh, is is working with the reality of a of a site that is here in Amherst. That's very important. That's in downtown, and um, I think we've tried to do the best we can to make that site work, and and again try to design for both now and the future. Okay. okay. Um, Erica has a comment, and then yeah. after that, I think we should open it up to the public comment. Okay. We haven't gone through the uh, points yet. Uh, I. Uh, yeah, I, so I, I think it's probably safe to say that um, 
that the board is going to continue um, their review uh, for this right. project. Okay. So, um, okay. Uh, the, yeah, yeah. So, the, the, okay. uh, going You're through good. the specific design standards could be uh, do that to the next meeting or, okay. the, or subsequent meetings. Very good. All right. All right. So, my, my question is um, regarding um, the Phoenix Pleasant. And is that a totally separate agenda item? Um, or is it? something that we can ask questions about now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, just to be clear, um, so your, your uh, both uh, applications are listed on the agenda uh, that Catherine um, um, read aloud earlier. Um, your review is being done jointly uh, together, but the motions themselves will be done separately. All right, and I don't even think that this is, um, because I think that the, 15 East Pleasant is about the staging area, but right. that's right. your property too. And I'm thinking about um, <laughs> there's now, there's the future, and then there's this middle time. And I'm wondering if you could tell us about what are the plans for 15 East Pleasant in the interim? Uh, we, the, the plans for 15 East Pleasant are just through construction at this point, right? To try to be able to deliver another project downtown and accommodate construction staging and a trailer and parking and getting vehicles off the street as best we can while we're still trying to, you know, redevelop the parking lots in the one story. So uh, we do not have a plan beyond that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the board? Comments? If not, then Maureen, do you think we can open it up to the public and can you tell us? Sure. Uh, just one second. Um, Ms. Brestrup has raised oh, her sorry. hand. I can't see her hand. Okay. I just wanted to make a comment about um, 15 East Pleasant and right now it's going to be used for construction staging and when the construction is done it's going to be paved over but there will be a, a fence around it so it's not going to be um, actively used as a parking lot. If the applicant wanted to actively use it as a parking lot he could go through another process um, and I don't remember if it's a special permit or site plan review to create um, a commercial parking lot there. But I think that his plan does not include that. So it's just going to end up being um, paved over with a fence around it. So that's, that's what you would be commenting on or reviewing as a final um, product. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, okay so let's uh, take a look at, um, for public comments, uh, Pam Rooney has raised her hand. Uh, could I make a just a short statement to the public to remind people oh, sure. that um, we're that does we're only talking about the design of the building, uh, nothing about uh, who's living there or what they're doing inside. Uh, so please keep your comments relative to the design, what you have seen. Um, tonight or what you have heard tonight. And just to clarify, it's the design of the building and the site right. and any, you know, exterior changes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Go ahead. Okay. Hi, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Thanks for letting me in. Um, I have not heard anyone ask any questions really about the landscape and the site. Uh, and the fact that we have uh, the opportunity to reestablish a very strong streetscape language that extends all the way the, up the east side of North Pleasant and East Pleasant Street. No, excuse me, all the way up North Pleasant Street until it gets to one East Pleasant where the, the town standards were truncated and um, the landscape <clears throat> excuse me, the landscape language was completely dropped. And um, it, it does feel that it's within the purview of the design review board to uh, reinstate uh, what is uh, really written in as town standards. And that goes to the pavement material, it goes to the, the edging. Uh, it also goes to the planting of street trees um, the five street trees that were planted in front of One East Pleasant are the worst examples of street trees I've ever seen. They're mismatched, they're undersized. So I think you all have it in your purview to, again, reestablish that strong street language that is really in integral to the town center and the town experience. 
and I'll just stop at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maureen, how many people do you see uh, from the public so we can try just to- Just two time? more. How many? Uh, two more. Okay, fine. Uh, uh, Dorothy Pam. Hello, Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. Um, I'm looking at the design of the commercial space, which is all glass and recessed. And um, perhaps I'm going beyond, but I thought what store, what commercial space would thrive in that rather kind of shadowed, uh, but glassed place. And it would be an ice cream store right across from the park. But my question is, would an ice cream store be able to pay the rent. I don't know, you know what the rent would be like or how much money it would generate, but everyone's talked about the fact we've got a park and now we've got no place to get an ice cream cone. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on this. Okay, do you want to uh, finish? Let's finish the public comments and then we can ask Kyle uh, if he would like to respond, okay? Sure, um, one second. Uh, so next we have um, Mary Sayer. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I'm Mary Sayer. I live in North Amherst, and I just wanted to encourage um, the comments that the Design Review Board has said about this um, building being a, a wall blocking the site view. And um, I want to let Dave know that many people in North Amherst actually do care about our view lines as we come into the center of Amherst. Um, we certainly do give a damn about the feeling of the town as we enter it. Um, I already feel that uh, the view has been blocked considerably by one Kendrick place. I feel already the town is pushing back at my coming in and to have another of uh, that kind of feeling of a big wall. Um, anyway, I, I just wanna say that I think Tom's comments are, are good ones. I think landscaping actually would help quite a bit if there was a, a nice streetscape in front of it to um, break up that wall effect. But please don't make comments about people not caring about what the, the, not giving a damn about what the town's entrance looks like. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, next we have Janet McGowan. So my name is Janet McGowan. I live at 706 South. Whoops, we lost her. Am I back? Am I back? Yes. Now? No, okay. Now I'm a, lot of, a lot of things telling me to mute or unmute. So um, once again, I'm Janet McGowan. My name, I live at 706 Southeast Street. I'm on the planning board, but I'd like to make comments really in my capacity as a resident and an almost lifelong attorney. Um, I would really urge you to, to talk about the design standards and go through them one by one and see how they apply to this project. Because it's not a building that's in isolation. It's set in a community. Um, you know, and that it has really, it, and when you, you know, when I read the design standards, it, I'm very encouraged by the specificity of it. I've read, I've gone through the um, design review board um, handbook, you know, when you're looking at windows and building heights um, and in the context of the surrounding in the buildings that are all around the downtown. I know that when one East Pleasant Street was being considered, all the tallest buildings in the downtown were compared, but they didn't look at the, the lower buildings. And so I just encourage you to look at those standards very carefully um, and look at the fact, you know, the, the, the master plan, the fact that we're living in a New England town, how, how that building will fit in and work um, and how it fits with all the buildings around it, tall or small, and, and the different architectural styles. You know, I, I don't want to tell you what your job is, but I do think it's the job of a board to apply legal standards or design standards to the to what's at the hand and I I'm hoping that you do that really thoroughly I just um, I know a lot of people are looking to the board and the planning board um, on this building but also on like the shape of downtown and where it's going and you know keeping the good qualities we like and adding to them that's all thank you thank you Janet okay 
Um, so next we have uh, Susanna Muspratt. Thank you very much. Um, I just have a practical question. It's easy to forget at this time of year, but uh, where are you going to put the snow? Okay, we can get to that. Anything else from that? Okay. Well, that's all for now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, and that's there are no other uh, raised hands. Um, okay, so uh, that means that we could, Kyle, uh, you could respond to some of those, uh, particularly the one about the, um, the use of the retail. Uh, I meant to ask you that myself, if, if that um, space is, designed to accommodate any sort of food service or uh, uh, ice cream or coffee, so to speak. Um, where's Kyle, is he? I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you heard the few questions about, yeah. I did, I, I think- Ice cream. <laughs> I, I, I love ice cream. Um, I think that the the idea of this retail being somewhat tied to the park is is the right idea. I think that you know we're very fortunate to have a another town common uh, that's coming to the town on the north end. Um, I think it's you know through the bearing of the power lines was the first step. The the uh, the playground and the sidewalk improvements are the next step. All the art that's gone in there is 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 headed in the right direction. So the the reprogramming of that site from the former single family homes with the lot lines and the shrubs and the curb cuts that are still remaining to a proper downtown park uh, could very much use, you know, a ground floor tenant that's associated with it. Um, uh, I, we would, we accommodate in terms of access to the roof in the event that there is a requirement for a hood or some access to the roof from a mechanical equipment standpoint. Um, uh, beyond that, we have not, uh, we don't have the tenant picked. Um, we don't know what it would be, but I think obviously that as that, as Kendrick Park grows up and becomes a more formal park, I think, uh, having something associated that with that would be, would be great. Um, uh, I think relative to the sidewalk, uh, improvements that were brought up, um, obviously there's, the town has those sidewalk were, improvements were a big improvement to downtown. Um, as as everyone, as most know, that they stopped at the One East Pleasant when it was when it was the carriage shops, um, and became kind of asphalt there. Um, and so I think that that is a conversation that is less about the applicant uh, and more about you know we could rebuild that however the town directs us in terms of do we want to continue those sidewalk improvements or do we want it to you know uh look like the new sidewalks that were put in on the west side of kendrick park um so we we can uh yeah. we are agnostic on that uh relative to uh the town's uh sidewalk improvements um in in regards to snow um that's always that's always a, a, an issue but um uh, as with every, you know, downtowns, uh, you, you make do, you figure out a way to, to make it happen. That's what Amherst has always done. That's what we would do here. Um, and I think that, uh, I don't know if I'm forgetting anything else. That may be it. So, and Kyle, it could potentially mean that at that one retail space that, um, an attorney could rent that. The, when you say retail, I think we immediately think of, you know, a sure. store. But uh, in your, you know, I think in the general sense, it could be rented by an insurance agent or an attorney or any kind of business. Is that not? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The intent, the the space will support whatever tenant comes in there. Right. Um, obviously, we've got Mass Mutual up the street, which not everybody was happy about. Um, uh, we've got a sushi, Aya Sushi next door in One East Pleasant. Um, so there's, there are a number of different options and obviously yeah. retail has changed more in the past 15 months than it had in the past yeah. 10 years. So are you prioritizing um, 
what you want. I mean, uh, if somebody says, I'd like to come up, uh, open up an insurance agent agency or pay this rent, would you say, uh, or would you put, let that person come in or would you try to hold it for a retail, which is because a different personality. I think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a different, uh, you know, by the time this building opens, it'll be different than it is now. Okay. Uh, I think we have to be conscious of the right fit, obviously, um, as we've tried to do elsewhere. Um, and I think that um, it's a, you know, that, that retail has to work within the building and that's what we've tried to, we've tried mm -hmm. to uh, make. Okay. Okay. Well, I just might jump in here and say, that I don't think an insurance agency or an office would enliven the downtown. The whole idea of the downtown is to connect uh, what we found out when I uh, when I had Judy's for 43 years and shut it down last year was that the most traveled sidewalk in downtown was in front of Judy's and extended up and dissipated out as it got out to the toy box. So my goal is how do we enliven our downtown? How do we bring it back? Uh, and really, that's going to be a tough charge for us for the next five years. So we're going to do anything we possibly can to bring back the public to the downtown because right now it's dead as a doornail. So yeah. okay. there you go. All right, okay. That's my two cents worth. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Bressrup would like to speak. Hello, I just wanted to note that um, the town has been moving away from the design of the sidewalks um, that were either brick in the middle with concrete on the side or concrete in the middle with brick on the side. It really, they don't hold up very well. They tend to fall apart really easily. Um, we've been moving towards a more, um, what, streamlined um, type of sidewalk, um, which doesn't mean that we can't have a gracious and comfortable and lovely streetscape. Um, we can add trees, we can mm -hmm. add benches, we can add spaces. But as far as the pavement of the sidewalk goes, we're moving away from that. Um, brick and concrete uh, combination. The only place I've seen that where it's actually been done uh, really well and has held up very well is um, in front of the Lord Jeff, where Amherst College paid for that to happen. And um, later on around the Spring Street area where the town built those sidewalks, but it's really a problem to keep those up over the years. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Okay, are there any, um... I'm watching the time now, Maureen, whether we should uh, just sort of collect our thoughts, uh, comments, and then um, plan to really dig into the um, design review board um, standards at another meeting. What's the pleasure of the group? Are there more questions or comments while Kyle and David are here? from any of the design review board. Will our, I have a question. Will our sure. follow-up meeting not include Kyle and Dave? I don't know, Maureen. The, would... the, the, I, think, I think Kyle and Dave would like to attend the next meeting. Okay. That's what I assumed. <laughs> okay, all right. We would also <laughs> like you to better to do than sit around. <laughs> yeah. Kyle, you've been spending all your time with us. Don't you have a life? <laughs> Yeah, between us and the planning board and everybody else. It, it's been a while. It's been a while. We haven't been before you guys in a while. So, yeah. <laughs> so something that I was um, think uh, that I'm planning to do is to uh, type up the the meeting uh, minutes, um, and um, particularly um, you know the comments from the uh, the DRB members and from the public of suggestions and questions and to provide it to the applicant in preparation of the of the subsequent meeting. Um, so if, if the applicant chooses to um, update their plan set or, or materials, um, they would know what to work off of. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Could I, could I ask when would we, what is, when would we meet again? Yeah, great, excellent question. Um, it looks like um, I sent out a doodle poll to all the DRB members, and it looks like they're they are all available on Monday, June seventh, from five to seven. Okay, good. Okay, 
And that, I would add is, that if you are providing um, new information, updated materials, et cetera, um, the board would need it uh, at least one week in advance uh, of the meeting. Uh, so there's enough time to uh, circulate and to review. And does the, does the DRB meet once a month? No, they meet as needed. As needed. Yeah. Is there a time before June 7th, which is almost a month away? Uh, it looks like, Maureen, we did a doodle poll, and that looks like... That was the, the first available meeting. Yeah. So. I have one on my calendar. Uh, June 4th, I have a DRB meeting. Is that not happening? Well, there were lots of options. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. I'm back in May. That was May. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah, there were lots of options, Jan, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. May calendar is open. Uh, I'm asking because we're before uh, the planning board on June 2nd. Yeah. And I was trying to do that before we were before the planning board again. Right. Is that the final planning board discussion of your project? Uh, I, I don't, I don't know that. Yeah. Probably not. Maureen, do you know? It's up to the, the planning board. Um, yeah. You know, there could be one meeting, there could be two more meetings. I, I don't know. Tom, uh, did you want to weigh in or Chris uh, Brestrup, would you like to weigh in on that? I think it's going to, it's going to take at least one more meeting on June 2nd, but I wouldn't be surprised if it went beyond that. We still have to um, look at 15 East Pleasant. There's a special permit that's being um, introduced for, uh, to deal with a, a setback issue, and we'll be holding, opening that public hearing on June 2nd. So I'm imagining that there will be another planning board meeting beyond June 2nd. Okay. It just seems pointless for us to send our recommendation to the planning board if it turns out that we're a week later than their main discussion of the project. That's all. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. But what, un unless another poll, Maureen could send out another request for a an agreeable meeting date. Um, well, there were only June dates in that last poll. Uh, well, we could do it live right here. Are folks available on Monday, May 31st? No. Is that a holiday? <laughs> is that, oh, is that Memorial Day? How about Tuesday, June 1st? Yes. Yes. Can we do Wednesday? That's, uh, that's the planning board. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's, no. uh, Wednesday is the planning board meeting? <laughs> okay. Yeah. What about the out. what about the week prior to that? So uh, if we are going to say uh, we need at least one week in advance, um, you know, he would need to submit um, things by the end of this week, I think. And what? How? how uh, we have the, how, the week of the 24th is what I'm asking. Yeah. That gives um, us about hosting a public meeting. Um, how about uh, if, if, if uh, how about Wednesday, May 26th? That works. That works for me. Yes. Planning board that day. So that's planned. Okay. How about do, Tuesday? I can do I Tuesday. Don't, um, I'm, 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 oh, we don't I, have a planning board? I think we have, we have not scheduled a planning board meeting for May 26th. We have one on May 19th, and we have one on June 2nd. I think so, I just have one every Wednesday. I know. Me too. You should assume you always have a meeting on Wednesday. Now you do. <laughs> if, that, if that works for folks. Um, May 26th, which is Wednesday. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so that's instead of June 7th. Correct. Yes, I guess so. So okay. Wednesday. Uh, so that means that the deadline for submitting new information to uh, this board would be May 19th. Right. Right. Okay. Any other uh, points that, that anybody on the board would like to bring to the attention of Kyle um, for his homework? Or our um, I guess I'd just like a more detailed rendering of exactly, I know you described it to us, 
but a, a, an actual rendering of what's going to happen to the wall between the cemetery and the building, the trees, the egress behind the building, the fence. You had talked about moving the fence. And just, I'd like to know that a little better. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking at that side of the cemetery for a number of different things. Um, <clears throat> or, I'm sorry, as rep the historical commission, we is now the historical yeah. commission. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and uh, we were concerned about the trees and the proximity of the graves and the grade and everything. So I guess I'd just like to have a little better rendering there that I can take back to the um, commission. And I think we have a fairly complete landscaping plan uh, do we not? Uh, it was suggested. Yeah, but that's not really a landscaping issue. That's more. Oh, I wasn't. No, I no. I, no. I mean, no. I'm talking about uh, oh, the okay. something else. Uh, I thought we had a fairly complete landscaping plan. It, uh, one of the callers was concerned that maybe we didn't, but I. I, I we can. We're going to discuss it. Let's put it that way. We will discuss it. Can I understand what Jan's saying? Yeah. Okay. And then Along I'd like those to see Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Tom. I was just going to say I'd like to see a rendering from the roundabout and one from Prey Street. OK. Yeah. At, at eye level. Uh, Lindsay, did, were you going to uh, make a um, Yeah, just um, we didn't really talk about lighting at all, but it would be nice to see if there I don't know if it's possible to do a photometric study, but just something that generally generates some indication of the light levels um, at the entrance and in the courtyard area. I know that's something that has been raised as a general concern. So okay. um, if, if next meeting is the right time to review that, um, or if, if there's another time, but I think it should be noted as one of the questions. And then if there's any uh, pedestrian, um, for furniture, furniture furnishings along the south uh, and west side of the property. Um, I know you have the the granite blocks, which I think are a nice integrated um, opportunity for seating. But um, you know, if there's any additional proposed outdoor furnishings, that would be helpful to see. Yeah. Um, and I think lastly is just building signage. Um, which I think you talked about getting back to um, as part of your, for the retail component, but in terms of the actual building itself, you've done a really nice job of providing signage integrated to the building um, in your other locations. And I don't see that here, but I imagine it's part of your design process. And then is the leasing office going to be there permanently or is it just there for the first few years? Permanent. Oh, okay. So you'll continue to need it. Mm -hmm. Didn't you say, Kyle, you're going to, you were thinking about combining all three or, or all of your yes. leasing offices? Yes. Okay. So it's permanent. It would stay there. Oh, so it would take, it would um, serve for the other two buildings as well? Yeah, through Amherst Innovative Living, the management company. I see. Okay. And one other thought that I had early on was uh, the walkway between um, East Pleasant and the the tree line of going back to the cemetery is—is is there lighting along the way uh, that seemed like? Do you have some sort of low lights or? Yeah, there's there's lights on on the bollards, down lights, and oh, with, okay. integrated within that fence. Yeah, okay. integrated within the, the granite wall. So, so you're it, not walking through a dark alley to get from East Pleasant to the cemetery. Right, it hits the that hits the that hits the walk surface on the ground, okay. and All then right. there's. Um, uh, lighting from the lobby that's 24 7 that right. always be lit, and then the light on the top of the column okay okay all right um, i believe a, one of the board members asked if um uh, the parapet could be um or, or, or screening in general could be provided to uh, on the roof to screen the uh the roof equipment so if if the applicant is, is uh, agreeable to that i think that that would be nice to see that in the rendered plan uh -huh. and, and just real quick on that, I think that the what you see on the renderings from Halleck Street are the elevator penthouse and the roof screen. So the reason that it looks higher is not because it's equipment. That's the overrun for the elevator. 
and the penthouse to give the door, you know, to have the door access. And so that's got the pitch roof on it. And then, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the roof screen is, is underneath that. So I think that's, that I, I know that that's accurately represented in the rendering, but that's that's not the roof screen. That's the elevator overrun that's that's popping up and being shown from the from the Pleasant Street side. Yeah. So, okay, yep. Sorry, Maureen. I was just going to say to clarify. I guess if in light of Christine Chris's comments about the potential extension of the parapet, then our recommendations for um, maximal screening, if there are going to be changes, because I see that rendering and I think it's pr pretty clear. Um, as shown, but if you're going to make changes, it would be nice to see that updated. Understood. I just be careful about making that too much higher because proportionally to the rest of those stories of the building, you wouldn't want it to be too tall or it's going to throw off how the whole side looks. You know? I mean, not to, not to throw like the whole <laughs> no, I, I, I think request it, at you, but I think it, it, that might also warrant like a view from Kendrick Park, um, if, if possible. Um, that could even be like a Photoshop thing, but <laughs> get a sense of how much visibility and to Jan's point, like, it, um, you know, how high is too high and how how low is too low. And, and I don't know that we can answer that. Oh. Well, and I, I think that the we don't have an intent to raise the parapet. Um, I can just say that right now. I think that the intent is to use the roof screen because that's further back from the end, end wall. So it's not as high right at the face of the elevation. Try to push that equipment towards the center of the roof as much as we can. Centralize the tallest equipment, which is the ERV and the generator. Allow the smaller uh, condensers that just sit on the little feet to be towards next to that screen and then just try to keep that in. So I don't think we have an intent to raise that, that parapet beyond where it is now. Any other questions or comments before we adjourn? Anything, for Kyle, any questions for us as a- I don't think so. <laughs> it's your turn. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. All right, then uh, we'll meet again in a couple of weeks. Uh, and Chris or Maureen, uh, do you have any um, last minute uh, comments or thoughts for us? Because next time what we will be doing, and, and everybody, I know you have a copy of the design standards. What we will do is be going through them one by one and um, putting our best thoughts into each of the nine points, the strategic nine points. All right, Maureen, can, can we go ahead and adjourn this meeting? Sure. All right. I move, I move, we adjourn. Oh, Jan, thank you. <laughs> you got you your want, chance. Tom, you want to second that? You don't want to be Tom will second, meeting. okay. The move and second it. Is there any discussion that if not, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Aye, okay, very good. Uh, we'll see you in a few weeks. Thank Thanks you for your everybody. time. Thanks, Kyle.